squamous cell carcinoma variants, um, genetic disorders, and hopefully we can, uh, uh, Bishoy is going to comment a little bit about that in a second, and then also radiation-induced uh, bladder cancers. And so the thing that I think I've learned a lot from early in careers, we got to know what we don't know, and that's really going to be the next step in how we can push the field forward. And so we really don't know up to about 30% of bladder cancers. We don't really have a clear risk factor, and that happens more often than not. And I see that a lot in my younger patients who really do not have any known risk factor that we can elicit. So that is where we really need to make the next step in de determining bladder cancer uh, development, but also figuring out those risk factors and those mechanisms. And so this session, again, we're going to really look at three kind of unique angles of bladder cancer development, and we're going to look at it from the internal, and these slides are not going. We're going to look at the internal environment with um, Laura and Phil and their work with the urinary biome and looking at potential envir internal environmental factors. We're going to look at the genetic predispositions front with uh, Bishoy and looking at some of his work that has been done. And then we have Lauren, who's a, a veterinarian, who's done a lot of work in the, uh, with canine models and looking at the bladder cancer development in a non-human model. And then we're going to kind of tie all these three things together. So these are the three angles uh, that we're going to be really looking at today. So with that, I want to bring up uh, Bishoy, if you can start this session. Right, so uh, hi everyone. I'd like to um, thank uh, Dr. Patel and Dr. Porton for uh, the invitation to uh, speak to you today. Uh, my name is Bishoy Faltas. I'm a medical oncologist and a physician scientist at Law Cornell Medicine. And I will uh, talk to you today about germline genetics and, and some, I'll show some work in progress that we're doing in uh, the interaction of germline genetics and uh, some uh, interesting uh, environmental exposures. These are my disclosures. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'll just give an introduction to germline variation as a source of uh, missing heredity and urethelial bladder cancer. Uh, I'll discuss our recent advances in our understanding of identifying deleterious germline variants using whole exome sequencing and targeted sequencing and the impact of these deleterious uh, germline variants and protein structure and function. And I'll uh, then discuss germline somatic interactions in urethelial cancer and, uh, as I mentioned, some work in progress in environmental exposures. So why should we study uh, germline variants? Um, so let me just, uh, so germline variants are, are variants that are sort of uh, really under the surface. There are some, uh, we, you know, let me just, just uh, introduce some basic definitions. So for the purposes of this talk, germline variants are, are uh, uh, variants that we're born with, that were inherited from our parents. Somatic variants are variants that are detected only in the tumor and not in, in the germline. Uh, and there, there are lots of different reasons why it's very hard for us to actually uh, study these uh, variants or that so far has been uh, not easy to uh, study these variants. Some of them is that if one was to design a study uh, to, uh, to uh, sequence patients and study their germline, there are a lot of regulatory hurdles to try to, to in terms of reporting the uh, study results back and so on, uh, protecting patient anim anonymity. They're also not... Uh, the bioinformatic pipelines that we use for uh, somatic sequencing are not necessarily optimized to detect germline variants, and there are a lot of uh, a lack of functional annotation in, can in a cancer-specific context. And, and you may, you, I'm sure you may have heard the term uh, variant of unknown significance, which is actually pertaining to germline variants, and that generates a lot of uh, uh, a lot of complexity, a lot of anxiety for patients. Um, that being said, uh, we, you know, we are starting to, uh, as a community, as a bladder cancer research community in the past few years, we have starting to learn a lot more about the source of these germline variants as a source of missing uh, heredity in urethelial cancer. Uh, so I think everybody in this room knows urethelial cancer causes significant morbidity and mortality. Uh, and uh, this is a review that uh, was written by several of us who are doing uh, research in germline uh, variants in, in urethelial cancer. 
Uh, and you can see here uh, that uh, essentially about 20% of patients with uh, urothelial cancer may have some type of germline variant, and that's a very high percentage. You've heard uh, earlier estimates somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. The variation between th in these estimates just depends on the definitions of what one would consider a pathogenic or potentially deleterious germline variant. But you know, any way you slice it, it's a significant number of patients that have these uh, germline alterations. Uh, and, you know, even going back many, many years ago, there are studies that looked at heredity in urothelial cancer and found that uh, in this study, for example, where they were looking at twins, uh, they found that uh, essentially bladder cancer has the same degree of heredity as breast cancer, which is another a cancer that we uh, associate with all these uh, BRCA mutations. So, and, and that's been shown in, in twin studies in the past. Uh, so where where are all where's all this missing heredity coming from? Uh, so we undertook a study that was published in uh, Nature Communications a couple of years ago, where we used whole exome sequencing to try to identify uh, these deleterious germline variants in our patients, uh, and. Uh, can I say next slide and, and, and yeah, okay, great, thank you. Uh, so, uh, sort of a little bit of a lag here. So, uh, and what we've done is we designed a, a specific computational pipeline uh, to identify uh, these patients and essentially what we've done is uh, we look at the uh, transit, we looked at the patient, the whole exome sequencing uh, germline and somatic that are paired and we identified a pipe, we generated a pipeline that essentially uh, rules out uh, uh, noise and then tries to predict the presence of pathogenic germline variants based on their predicted function. We then looked at 11,000 uh, normal uh, uh, controls and looked at the prevalence of these uh, pathogenic variants in those, uh, in those patients as a control group. And then we also looked at, we then went back to the tumor and looked at the, uh, how these germline variants are evolving over time and, uh, and, and the interaction between these germline variants in um, and somatic variants. Next slide, please. So in our initial analysis, we found a significantly higher number. Now again, uh, mind you, this is an unbiased look at oral germline mutations that are potentially deleterious, and we found that in 56% of patients. Next. And this was, uh, these were uh, significantly uh, enriched in DNA repair pathways, as, as you one might expect. Next slide, please. And when we, interestingly, when we looked at panels, uh, so commercial sequencing panels that are used in a clinic, and we looked at our whole exome sequencing approach, the overlap was, was not uh, huge, which suggests that a lot of these variants that we identify in uh, with whole exome sequencing, essentially one is really expanding the pie if, if you do whole exome or whole genome sequencing. Now again, I don't know if we should be finding them or, or what are we, how actionable they are, but they're definitely, that doesn't mean they're not there and affecting the biology. Next uh, slide. Uh, we found that these patients, uh, that, that these variants are significantly higher in uh, our, uh, in, in ethnicity matched cohorts uh, compared to the uh, uh, other patients with other cancers. Next slide, please. And we found that uh, in urothelial cancer patients, the, there is a, a, significantly, a significant enrichment of these specific uh, potentially deleterious germline variants compared to patients with other cancers. Next slide, please. And then we looked at how they impact predicted uh, protein structure and function. Next slide, please. And uh, here we looked at these CAT scores, which are computational predictions of uh, these deleterious germline variants. We see that they're, they're predicted to truncate these proteins. Uh, and that, that's what's driving this very uh, significant difference in uh, these CAT scores. Next slide, please. And uh, we, we, we saw, we then reasoned that essentially uh, these deleterious germline variants or potentially deleterious germline variants will cluster with somatic variants uh, that affect uh, the, uh, the protein function and we see that that is the case. Next slide. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, look at uh, some of these proteins and where we map the effect of these variants to the three-dimensional uh, structure of the protein. And you can see the, all these gray areas are truncated areas of the protein. 
uh, in, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the, the top left, which is this protein called XBA or xeroderma pigmentosa. Uh, a, uh, which is a, uh, next slide, is a part of a, uh, a transcription factor and DNA repair uh, 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 complex, and we confirmed the presence of this particular germline variant mutation using Sanger sequencing to the, from the blood of uh, one of my patients who ha harbored this truncated. Thank you. Uh, and you can see here, so again, this is a part of a XBA transcription factor 2H uh, complex, which is involved in uh, nucleotide excision repair. And you can see that this truncating variant essentially removed or truncated the main uh, DNA binding domain. And if you look on the right, you'll see that it actually co-clusters with other, uh, uh, other germline variants in patients who have xeroderma pigmentosa. Next slide, please. Uh, we then looked at the germline somatic interactions in urethelial cancer. Next slide. And we see that uh, essentially uh, uh, these, uh, I think the title is wrong here. We see that, uh, sorry for that, but we see that essentially these variants are being enriched uh, as the tumors progresses from the primary to the metastatic uh, uh, state. Next slide, please. And we see that as a, a deepening loss of heterozygosity where there's a loss of the wild type allele, which again suggests that these uh, variants are playing an important role in tumor progression. And you can see that in matched primary and metastatic samples that you can see here on the right side. Next slide, please. And then we looked at the germline somatic interactions in these tumors. So we looked at essentially the, in, in, in a given patient, so uh, each color here that you see on the left is uh, multiple tumor samples that are obtained from rapid autopsies or primary and met metastatic uh, biopsies. And uh, you can see that, uh, uh, you can see that essentially, um, uh, the in patients that have multiple samples, there's significant somatic heterogeneity, but then you have this layer of germline uh, mutations, and then the interactions, the unique interaction within each tumor between the, the uh, germline mutation and the some specific uh, set of somatic mutations within that tumor would activate, differentially activate a different tumor. So it adds another layer to the complex, somatic complexity uh, or, or heterogeneity of, uh, of tumors. Uh, so the next part is uh, sort of a lot more uh, relevant to what we're going to talk about today, which are the interactions between germline genetics and environmental exposures and bladder cancer. So I want to introduce you to this project that we have. So we have a project called the uh, Polyethnic 1000 Bladder Cancer Project, and you're going to hear about the larger uh, polyethnic uh, uh, project uh, in in, uh, in uh, other sessions, uh, and this is a project where we are leveraging the wonderful diversity of New York City, coming together and uh, bringing, uh, recruiting patients from diverse an uh, ancestries, and we're doing whole genome sequencing on 250 uh, bladder cancers. Uh, and this, this uh, we got a, a grant from the New York Genome Center and the Polyethnic 1000 Consortium, and, and as you'll hear, uh, um, in, in uh, one of our plenary sessions, this is not just covering bladder cancer, this is actually covering multiple cancers, uh, and I, I happen to be leading the bladder cancer project. Uh, we, this was actually uh, featured in the New York Times, uh, where, where uh, there was a significant uh, um, attention given to uh, this project because of, uh, you know, the, the uh, need for uh, more uh, diverse uh, enrollment and, and studies of patients from diverse ancestral backgrounds. Uh, but, you know, back to what Neil was saying earlier, so we know about the risk factors for bladder cancer, uh, and they're very different in, in, in different populations. So Neil mentioned, for example, that in, in, in the United States, it's, uh, and in the Western world, it's mostly uh, smoking that we know about, industrial exposures, chemicals, and so on. In uh, parts of Africa and the Middle East, 
it is mostly schistosomiasis. Uh, this is, I would like to talk about schistosomiasis a little bit. So this is the global distribution of schistosomiasis. Uh, and this is a, a parasite that uh, infects patients and then uh, the ova are deposited in the uh, bladders. And eventually, 10, 15 years down the road, the patients develop uh, schistosomal bladder cancer. And again, you can see here, it's mostly in Africa, South America, some parts of Asia. Um, it, but this affects 200 to 300 million people. Uh, so it's not a small problem, it just happens to be a problem that doesn't affect this part of the world, so it's very understudied. Uh, so, and what eventually happens is that, again, these flukes infect patients. Usually patients get it through swimming in infested waters, and then it gets into the blood, and then it deposits the ova into uh, the bladders. Um, and it's associated famously with squamous cell carcinoma. This is some, uh, some previous analyses looking at uh, Tanzania, looking at Senegal, and uh, most of these are really associated with squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, which is a very aggressive uh, uh, variant. We don't really understand how this happens. Uh, there is some very interesting work here from uh, 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 Michael Shea's lab where they actually take schistosomal ova and they intravesically inject it into uh, the bladders of mice and then they do uh, transcriptional profiling to see the uh, differences in the expression profiles and as you can see here there's a, a time uh, dependent uh, change in a lot of these in, in a lot of cytokines there's obviously uh, just just in normal uh, urethelium that is injected with these schistosomal Ova, so very strong inflammatory reaction. Uh, we know a lot about just non schistosomal squamous cell carcinoma, and this is some, some landmark uh, work here by, uh, that was presented uh, by Josh Warwick and Dave DeGraff and Hikmat Al Ahmadi, where loss of expression of FOXA1 uh, is, is really uh, driving this uh, squamous uh, morphology. Uh, but we don't really know how that translates to a schistosomal bladder cancer. So this is, again, from a review by Michael, where uh, they have this really nice schematic for what could be happening in terms of potential mechanisms that occur during uh, schistosoma hematobium infection, uh, which, re again, range from uh, you know, tumor proliferation, there are uh, specific uh, proteins that are secreted by these ova, a protein called Ipsy that he has characterized uh, fairly well, um, ox oxidative stress, there's you know, all sorts of inflammatory processes that are really you know, poorly characterized in, in patient uh, tumors. Uh, so these are, you know, some of the mechanisms, and that's something that we are uh, finally starting to uh, tackle in some of the work in progress that I'll show you now. Uh, there's also a very interesting uh, relationship to environmental exposure. So this is a study that was uh, published um, in Egypt where they found that pesticides were associated with increased bladder cancer risk in a dose-dependent manner, and in this cohort, half of the patients had urethelial bladder cancer. Uh, uh, half of the patients who had urethelial bladder cancer had a history of schistosomiasis, so this may be an interaction between schistosomiasis and pesticides. Uh, and there's another study where they looked at uh, Egyptian patients that were uh, uh, that had significant organophosphorus exposure and found that there is uh, activation of KRS gene. Uh, and again, in this study, 69% of these patients had schistosomiasis. Uh, I am also very interested in the interaction between schistosomiasis and uh, uh, nitrosamines or, 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 or uh, subcarcinogenic doses uh, of, of nitrosamines. This is a very, so I was researching this and I found this very old study from 1980 where they were giving BBN to, uh, to uh, monkeys and, uh, and, they, and then in also infecting them with schistosomiasis. And it's interesting that BBN by itself uh, in, in this animal model did not induce a lot of changes. Um, and uh, schistosomiasis by itself did not induce a lot of changes, but you really start seeing these premalignant lesions when you combine schistosomiasis and BBN uh, that is, that is you know, uh, relevant to cigarette smoking. So these are some of the gaps in our understanding of schistosomal-induced bladder cancer, and, and I, you know, I, 
we have a lot of interesting hypotheses about what could be happening. Uh, so what are the molecular mechanisms by which schistosoma hematobium induces bladder cancer? Do environmental exposures such as pesticides, herbicides, or smoking synergize with schistosomal infection to accelerate bladder tumor genesis? And how can the immune response uh, involved in granuloma formation shape the, the damage or, or inflammation in general induced by schistosoma hematobium towards malignant transformation. So I'll show you some, some of the work. So uh, this is Egypt. I'll take you to a, a trip to Egypt. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, a place called Aswan. And you can see here a lot of, so a lot of these schistosomal infections are along the Nile Basin. Uh, and, and the Nile is the longest uh, river or one of the longest rivers in the world. And you can see here, uh, you know, again, a lot, of, a lot of these infections are along the tributaries of uh, people who live along the Nile. Uh, so we were able to work with uh, a collaborator, Chris Lofredo, uh, and who has done epidemiological studies of schistosomiasis in Egypt. And they have collected uh, these tumors with very uh, complete um, uh, epidemiological annotation in terms of occupation, environmental exposures, and so on. And that was actually NIH-funded work. We were able to obtain these tumors. And if you look here, uh, so you, this is what this looks like. So these are the ova in the bladder cancer. Uh, and so the bladder cancer eventually develops after the ova. And what we did is we asked our pathologists to macro dissect or micro dissect these areas. And we insisted that we're sequencing tumors that harbor ova within them. And we're comparing those to other uh, non schistosomal cases from patients, from also from Egyptian patients, uh, that have no history of treatment uh, for schistosomiasis, no history of infection, and no history of treatment. Because if you remember, you know, patients can get treated for it, but if the ova are still there 10, 15 years later, they might still develop bladder cancer. So these are, you know, histopathologically positive versus histopathologically and, and what we call double negative cases uh, that we've sequenced it sequence them. And this is sort of the paradigm for our experiment. We're going to do, or we are doing whole genome sequencing. Uh, we're going to do, uh, this is, you know, I always, you know, uh, get approached with spatial uh, uh, technology uh, reps, and this is a question that sort of really lends itself to spatial technologies where you're looking at the interface between the ova and the uh, uh, schistosomal cancer, so that's something that we're definitely planning to do. Uh, and then we're going to work with uh, collaborators to and a mouse model to really uh, flesh this out. So we're, we're, we're going to figure this out. That's the plan. Uh, and uh, this is, we, we started, we already completed the whole genome sequencing. This is some of the very early early data. The nice thing about this is we can go back to the germline. So back to the germline, we can, we're sequencing germline and tumor from every patient, and we can infer the ancestry computationally. So you can see here, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the patients on the far right are the uh, Egyptian patients, and, and this is the admixture of different ancestries. Uh, and, and then you can see in the, in the middle, there are African Americans, and then on the, uh, on the left hand side are Caucasians. So you can see really sort of the admixture of, of ancestry there, and we're going to s try and understand again this at a much more sophisticated level, how that interacts with the risk of developing schistosomiasis. The nice thing about whole genome sequencing also is that we can do metagenomic studies, so we can actually pull the DNA. Remember I told you that we are actually uh, sequencing tumors that have ova in them that have genetic material, so we can actually pull the reads that don't map to the human genome and then map them, run them across a database using these metagenomic tools and essentially identify uh, the, the, the parasitome, if you will, that's in these tumors. So we've done that and you can see here this is some of our very early cases where we're actually able to pull out reads from schistosomiasis that the, 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 our algorithm identified that they're coming from schistosomiasis. So we're going to be able to understand the, the, you know, the strains and the evolution of the parasite itself with the uh, tumor. So in summary, uh, we've discovered a high prevalence of deleterious germline variants in urothelial cancer. Uh, we found that uh, these are uh, truncating tumor suppressor proteins. They're really playing an important role in uh, tumor progression, which we are, are working to understand in much more uh, mechanistic detail. Uh, it adds another, germline variation adds another level to uh, somatic heterogeneity. Um, 
and really needs to be uh, considered in precision medicine strategies. And then we're very excited about this uh, work in progress on dissecting the relationship between germline genetics, parasitic infections, and chemical exposures. And I think uh, this will hopefully result in additional insights that are not only applicable to the 300 million people that are infected with, uh, with schistosomiasis, but also to uh, urothelial cancer uh, that, that pati our patients here in the Western world develop. Uh, this work is a little bit hard to fund, so if anybody has any ideas about uh, thoughts on how to uh, generate excitement and, and, and generate, uh, 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 generate a lot of uh, discussions about that, I, I would uh, love to hear your